We have Alex Zomchak with us this morning. I think this is Alex's sixth year. He's a real regular here with the Bee Lab webinar series. <laughs> He's a master beekeeping instructor teaching throughout the region, multiple states, doing lots of programs, and he's also the apiculturalist at the beautiful Miami University. So Alex, I'm gonna turn the mic over to you. Thanks for, for being with us this morning. Well, thank you, Denise, uh, for hosting again, and OSU for this, uh, this lovely venue. Um, six years, has it been? No. Um, I'm suddenly feeling older than I was just a few minutes ago, so thank you for that. Um, can you hear me okay? Just, are we going okay? Sorry, I muted. Yep, you're fine. Everything Anybody? sounds good. Great. Super. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, we are uh, in the midst of spring here this morning, and with that comes a lot of things. So a, a small apology on my side. I'm kind of, I've, if you could see me here, I've got uh, tea and honey and cough drops and a whole series of things going on here. So I'm going to try not to blow through the mic uh, and, uh, and, um, and, and not talk through a cough drop. Uh, so uh, if my voice cracks here just a little bit, um, I don't know. It's the pollen. It's the flu. It's, it's something. So please bear with me. So uh, since time is our enemy on these things, we just never seem to have enough time. I, I do and I would like to leave a little bit of uh, room at the end for uh, questions. So um, let, me, let me get right to it. Um, from the opening slides here, um, um, I want to cover kind of two things that I'm not going to cover a lot. Um, uh, one is on the uh, left, the um, Ohio State Beekeepers Association APRI Diagnostic Kit. Uh, and the other one is a kind of a monograph, uh, a book that I have coming out later this summer. So my head has been in this space uh, for a little while. Uh, and it kind of came about organically. I mean, it just turns out that if you're in enough hives long enough, um, you start to knit things together and see things. And um, and I have to thank a lot of my fellow beekeepers out there. Um, beekeeping is changing. We have to change. And so I'm, I'm going to try to introduce the takeaway here really is going to be monitoring. Um, and, and, and how you answer, how I answer what monitoring means to me or you actually determines what kind of beekeeper you are or, or, or that you want to be. So it, it seems kind of easy, um, but this is an amorphous term. Uh, to some people, when you throw out the word beekeeping or, or monitoring, you know, some people are just kind of a set and forget it kind of beekeeper. And those were good in the old days, but not so much today. Um, some people are extremely proactive. Um, they have something I call situational awareness. Uh, their radar is constantly on. Um, others are more evidence-based. Um, you know, show me this, prove it to me. Um, many of us are, are simply reactionary. And we can even get to um, an, an interesting class of beekeepers today. Um, they, they call themselves honey producers versus beekeepers. Um, they're not into monitoring, per se, treating, per se. Um, for them, it's more of a commodity-based, um, uh, as if they were uh, a chicken farmer uh, raising eggs or something, um, and, and they're not really into um, uh, treating their bees, uh, taking care of their bees. And this is where I'm coming from. Obviously, I have a prejudice. I have a dog in this hunt here, and that is um, I really do believe that um, we have to um, – take a very proactive stance uh, with today's bees, and I'll make an argument for that. Um, and one last little caveat as we get started here. There are going to be one or two recipe slides in here uh, that when you first see them pop up, um, it'll be an adrenaline rush, and you'll want to run for the room. Uh, bear with me. I threw those in because, um, again, there's not enough time in a webinar. You can come back to these, um, and they're takeaways. Um, I'll just address them lightly to let you know that they're there, uh, but do please come back. We, we won't spend a lot of time on them, but I think you'll see why I put them there. So let, let's, after all of that, let's get started. Um, just quickly, uh, an intro for me. I am working out of Miami University down here in southwestern Ohio um, in, in, in our B-Lab here. And uh, for those, um, I'm, I'm an evidence-based individual. If after this, um, a lot of speakers that I've seen this spring uh, kind of give a presentation and walk away. Um, if you see something here, you hear something from me um, that you either want to add to or disagree with, 
at the end, I'll have contact information. Um, I welcome uh, the opportunity uh, to chat uh, with folks out there. Um, so uh, you see something, get back to me. So here's a nice bee yard. Uh, this is actually uh, a real one uh, from a friend of mine down the road. Uh, it was from last year. Um, it's probably something we'd all love to see. Uh, but the takeaway here, aside from the Goliath uh, hive in the center, is that notice also the variability. Um, this is what happens in a bee yard. This is what has always happened in a bee yard. You have strong hives, medium hives, weak hives. Um, it just seems, if anything, today, um, the highs get higher and the lows get lower. And to achieve some of these, you really have to go through a lot of machinations to make that happen. The good news is you can. Um, this was an example of, of a yard that I set up where there is a recipe at the end. If you do all of these things, um, and that's including a little bit of luck. You've got to have the right season, uh, but you have the right queen genetics. Um, you do early um, uh, stimulative and nutritional feeding, um, and then you do a lot of seasonal management and movement. Um, if everything works your way, um, you can literally uh, even out those yards. And, and this is kind of at the heart of monitoring. Monitoring isn't just about pests and diseases. Um, it has a lot to do with um, resources of the colony. And so one of the things you've got going here is if you provide the necessary resources, you begin to understand, again, that you do this, this happens. Or in another way, stimulus response. At the end of the day, our bees are complex but yet simple. And so um, I saw a hand go up in the air. Um, this might answer that one. Um, we had a 287 pound average um, honey production and that, that th this was because we kind of were challenged uh, to, to work with somebody on a honey production issue which isn't really where uh, my head is focused these days. I'm, I'm doing a lot more on queen breeding and genetics but the, the takeaway is that monitoring leads you in this direction um, and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of get to that. So I'm going to go through just a, a couple and we've got to sneak up on monitoring today. Um, so let's, let's get there. Um, yesteryear was very much like this. Um, it was a resource management kind of thing. You had boxes, you had bees, there were little pests and diseases. Um, maybe you captured some swarms, maybe you did some swarm control in your colonies. But at the end of the day, it was, as I was saying here, pretty formularic. I mean, you really did kind of have this recipe and you as a beekeeper were reasonably passive. Um, the bees pretty much took care of themselves and as I indicate here the big thing was bragging rights. Uh, how much honey did you produce? Then things started to change. We ramped it up a little bit. You went from having one hive to three hives. I know some individuals that are in the hundreds of hives now and so things became just a little more intense for you. You had to really get your resource management practices down. I mean, you have a lot of boxes out there. Um, I, I, I think a good example might be some of the folks that are doing um, uh, pollination contracts. Um, you, when, you, when you put out 5,000 boxes, 10,000 boxes, you better know a lot about those boxes, the, the frames, the amount of brood, uh, even where you're staging and the equipment. And, and that's, that was the next evolution in beekeeping per se. Um, then all of a sudden, diseases came on. We had had a couple of old ones, American fall brood, maybe European fall brood, um, and they were starting to raise their head. As we became more industrial beekeepers, um, we would see some yards kind of run away with themselves. It's kind of like what happens in monocultures and fields. Um, it, it's, it's easy to harvest, easy to manage, but if you have something break out, um, some disease, some pestilence, um, it just runs rapid fire and, and this kind of happened in beekeeping as we scaled up and our first reaction was to kind of treat you know in the spring you treat in the fall you treat and as we were sneaking up on how does it all work um, we got to that then pests came along not just diseases and that was when it really all changed about 25 years ago all of a sudden varroa in particular um, really what has changed the very nature in the face of beekeeping and this plays a role in today's monitoring because it is now the pest that won't go away. So we have to learn to control it, we have to learn to live with it, 
um, and there are lots of reasons why and, and lots of reactions to that. Um, and that'll actually be one of the things I chat about in just a minute, how people are reacting even now, 25 years later, to Varroa um, is, is becoming really contentious of all things. Um, and then finally, with all of that, we realized that you couldn't just treat for these things in the spring and in the fall. You picked a date. Um, you had to incorporate something that was an integrated pest management or IPM program. You literally had to use different archicides, miticides. Um, you had to use them at different times. Some were effective. They became less effective over time. And this kind of takes us right up to where we are today. And beekeeping was simple in the golden years and has become more complex, but cer certainly still manageable. But, and this is where I think my, um, my interest in monitoring and, 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 and actually making the noise to put this topic out here now came from, is that this is a true story from last year. A friend um, got a, um, a uh, 10 nukes uh, from a sibling of theirs. Uh, they were heading into retirement. Uh, this was going to keep them busy. Um, there was going to be a, a small sideline honey operation, I suspect. And the individual didn't know a lot about beekeeping, had been around them, um, but found themselves to be pretty much like a lot of new beekeepers. Passive, um, let the bees kind of do their thing. I don't know that it's really a problem. I go out there, kick the boxes, and I see these things happening, so it can't be so bad, right? Well, the year ended, and of the ten uh, nukes that they got, six of them were dead by uh, the end of the year. Three of them were barely hanging on, and one of them was okay to, okay to good. Um, so I was making the argument that this is the kind of the thing that happens um, with beekeepers today, that the bragging rights have changed. It literally used to be how much honey, on average, did you make per colony. And now it's getting to the point in which, which is raising the specter of monitoring or changing the definition of beekeeping to how many hives came through the winter? How many hives are still alive? Another real story, and this one is actually from a, a week ago. Um, went to a, another uh, beekeeper's yard. Um, they were seeing things, but it seemed too early to be having problems. And if you look on the left versus the right, uh, again, the tail of two hives, um, even though the comb is a, is a little rough on the, the left-hand side, you can see that the laying pattern, aside from freshly wired comb where you can see the, where the wires are in, in the gauge, that, that's a nice laying pattern there. The queen is, is, looks to be doing a really good job. The brood looks healthy. Um, and then you look, again, the hive sitting next to it, um, and it's a totally different story. Um, something's wrong here. We call that the shotgun uh, a brood pattern approach. Um, and sure enough, when we did a, a quick mite check, we monitored uh, for mite levels, um, we found out that basically there was about a 10% plus mite level uh, on a 300 count uh, that we were doing, which takes us way, and, and you can see the effects on the colony. And, and one of the interesting things is this came on so early. Uh, usually mites come along a little later in the season. This season was a little warmer. So monitoring, uh, and it, this gets back to monitoring, monitoring is kind of a, we, again, we don't do something in the spring and we do something in the fall. Monitoring is going to bring in the idea that it has this kind of a feedback loop in it where you literally monitor as needed. Uh, you don't check for uh, your child's fever um, in, in uh, March and then again in July. Um, you, you, you're constantly kind of checking them, and the same thing actually applies to your hives. And we have to be just more aware of that because if, in fact, this individual had waited longer uh, for the colony on the right, um, this colony is on the verge of collapse already in the spring. Something had to be done. In this case, um, literally had to put in some archicides or some miticides and then come back to see if, in fact, they're effective. So <clears throat> the, the, the takeaway here was that even in this age now, when there's so much information out there, we're still seeing the same old, same old thing happening. And so it's clear that beekeeping using yesteryear's techniques um, aren't working. And if you're going to be a passive beekeeper, this is going to be 
problematic for you too. So believe that or not, we're right up to the overview of where we're going with this. And I want to talk of just a I want to sneak up on on monitoring a little bit from a slightly different perspective. And if if we look at this from a couple of different angles um, over the next 45, 40 minutes, um, hopefully I'm, I'm going to kind of cement the idea that works for you because you're going to find something in here um, that that identifies with how you like to operate. So um, we're going to talk about what a little bit of measuring in our, our everyday world, what monitoring is, and I'm going to try to define it my way. You will have ways of defining it your way, when to monitor, and then specifically a couple of examples on how we can use monitoring uh, for whether you're looking for honey production, whether you're looking to reduce mortality. Um, it's a tool. And so one of, one of these I love to throw up, my, my favorite little one is this was from yesterday. Um, I'm a big fan of, of measuring things, um, and sometimes you have to go to the external environment. Um, you can measure outside of your colony. That, that lawn chair that I had earlier, that's a great way of watching colonies. That's, that's a wonderful viewing glass. Just put a chair down and watch what's happening outside. And this is the big outside. Um, the hummingbirds have just come through Ohio, um, and they're on their way to mid-Wisconsin, uh, mid-Michigan, um, and I and I like to use those as a monitor for those of you thinking about honey production. Um, hummingbirds don't store a lot of brown fat. Uh, they can't overfly their nectar resources as the blooming in spring occurs. So they literally are large honeybees, if you will. Um, they have to let you know when this wave is coming along through the season. And so you can see it coming as you're looking to wonder, do I stop feeding? Um, when do I start supering up? Um, watching this ruby-throated hummingbird migration map, which is crowdsourced, I mean, you can get on it every day and you can watch this thing unfold through the spring, is not only fascinating, but can be very practical. A takeaway here um, is I've taken a couple of years for Ohio here, and if you just kind of stare into the, into the uh, numbers a little bit, um, including this year, it turns out that one of the things that makes beekeeping challenging and introduces the idea of monitoring is that there's this seasonal variability. If you look at some of the dates on here, when the hummingbirds came into Ohio, and sorry for those of you outside of Ohio, it's, it's the same. Um, we have about a two, two and a half, sometimes three week variability on when the hummingbirds come through your particular area. So when beekeepers do that, uh, well, just, just give me a recipe. Tell me on what day do I do what and if you have even can narrow it down to the time, 3 o'clock in the afternoon works for me, um, that's what some of us want. And that can be very difficult because we have to not only appreciate, as you saw in the two hives earlier, there is an inter uh difference. Um, there's a seasonal variability that you have to take into account. And so that in itself brings monitoring uh, to the forefront because monitoring is always asking, well, when do I do things? Well, it depends. It depends on your hives and the condition. It depends on this year and the condition. So another good example, I think that, that and, I'm, and I'm kind of creeping up on this, where beekeeping and monitoring come into play is, believe it or not, I think we human beings have a little bit of a difficulty with the view from a height, as I like to call it, and, and geometric progression, for the lack of a better term. So from the road, uh, for those of us near any of these great green expanses, this is a soybean field uh, from last year, um, it looks great. This is like looking at your colonies from the road. They look great. I see bees flying. I don't know if they're robber bees. I don't know if they're actual bees uh, from my colony or how many. I mean, to newer beekeepers, if they see 10 bees outside of a box, um, it, it's, it's bustling. Um, but we know uh, uh, through experience that during a honey flow, um, we'll see often two and three hundred flights a minute during a nectar flow. And so putting these things in perspective, if we get just a little closer, once again, now you've left the road, you've walked into your bee yard, and from here, things still look pretty rosy. I mean, look at, look at this. This is a, a, a postcard picture uh, for the soybean guild. But if you look a little closer, same field, same day, you start to see that there are problems going on. 
And if you even go a little closer, you'll see from a distance, from a height, you'll see more problems going on. So it's, again, macro to micro. And we have to be very careful about that when it comes to beekeeping. Um, we borrow a lot from other industries, be them gardeners or animal husbandry. But this same metaphor works exactly with what's happening in your colony. And you have to be prepared. Um, is this a disease in your colony? Is this a pest in your colony? Um, it's hard enough to figure out how this little seed within a matter of weeks um, you know, one cell begets two, begets four, begets eight, begets 16, and this geometric progression. But not only is it, you know, almost wondrous when the size of these plants occur when they do, but when we have a pathogen, when we have a disease, a pest come on, they too often mimic many of these geometric progressions. And before you know it, well, I was, I was just in there, what was it, last week or, or was it three weeks ago now? And then all of a sudden you go from um, no problem to a serious problem. And here's the proof in the pudding. Um, literally, if you look at, and this is uh, dated a little bit, um, Ohio looks to be coming in at 50 plus percent mortality into the spring this year. And for those of you out there in surrounding states, um, the numbers in general have gone up, again, not down. And so we have to put this in perspective. That little state of Wisconsin was my birthplace, uh, childhood place. And um, when I kept bees, my 10-year-old self, and kept records, um, I, was re I was annually having about a 3% mortality year over year. So just put this in perspective of where we've come in the last 30, 35 years. Um, and it's not getting any better. And again, doing the same thing over and over again, assuming that things are going to fix themselves, just doesn't seem to be working for us. Um, I got this slide from Reed Johnson. I thank him again. Um, he, uh, he was better at uh, color drafting on this than I was. And um, so when we're talking about colony collapse, what are these problems that are facing beekeepers now? And, and, and why is monitoring going to play, and how should it play a role here? Well, from, for many of you um, who are probably catching in here, you've seen or heard a lot of a lot of these, but we're trying to put it in perspective. What, what's, what's the biggest problem uh, to the smallest problem? And then interestingly enough, the problem that we have, and, and, and I threw this one on top of here, is it's even a little worse than the way it looks, if that's possible, and that is all of this stuff is moving in time. So they, these things are like, like taking medications that, that affect other medications. All of these things are affecting your colony's health, and you have to be aware of that. You have to be aware that um, this is why this isn't complex. If you get frustrated and you go, why have the people in the lab coats just not come up with a solution for this? It's complex. Um, it's ever-changing. It's interactive, um, and, uh, and solutions are to come. Interestingly enough, um, I threw this next one in because in, in, over the last, uh, I would say, half a dozen plus years, this had, had been, the, I think, the curve that was missing here. And that what was happening is as we came out with solutions or partial solutions, beekeepers were either slow to adopt them, didn't know to adopt them, um, used them haphazardly, used them indiscriminately, whatever it was, the facts are that when the data finally came in and we started parsing it a little bit, it turns out, and this it sounds like bad news, but it's actually good news, um, of the, say, 60% mortality roughly in Ohio, it turns out that 80% of that 60% is attributed to newer or newish beekeepers. It's not one of these things out there, but it is. It's just that in your tackling these problems, in your trying to help your bees come through the season, um, you're either not doing something, um, not checking for something, or doing something inadvertent or wrong. And um, I, I'm not going to go there. Um, there is a, a group of professional beekeepers out there that have adopted a new moniker. Um, I take a little umbrage with the language, uh, but it's called PPB. I put it at the top. Um, and we'll just leave it right there. Ask me what it means later. Um, but the good news from this 
is like those colonies I showed you in the beginning of a kind of a, a nice bee yard to a monitored and controlled bee yard, you can have a direct effect on this and there is nothing that's going to come out of the lab that's going to have, if we come up with a new archicide that knocks mites down or we come up with a new small hive beetle trap or we come up with a something, we will probably see traditionally a 3, a 5, a 7 percent mortality reduction associated with that. But if you go back to the numbers that I suggested, 80 percent of the 60 percent of mortality that we're seeing today can be controlled um, if we can get people back on a different type of beekeeping page. And I'm making the argument here um, that that page should be monitoring. So we don't know what happened to that slide. Uh, Denise warned me that there were a couple of them that didn't take. I remember um, the big news here, and this is where I want everybody, you, you, thanks for enduring you know, roughly 25 minutes of this so far, take a breath. It can get complex especially to newer beekeepers. It can seem, especially given those slides I showed you, overwhelming. But the fact of the matter is, at the end of the day, and another takeaway from here, and this is from decades of beekeeping uh, experience, at the end of the day, there are just a small, less than handful of pests and diseases that you have to worry about. And there's less than a handful of treatments, effective treatments, that you can employ. The key to those two is timing and actually applying some sort of methodology so that you can reduce that, ah, so it wasn't, that's why it was. Uh, memory was working. So the idea here is that, again, we can get a grip on where we are today. This isn't as dire as we would have the numbers be. There are people out there who, just like the honey production yard, there are folks out there who have yards that are literally experiencing 5% mortality, 10% mortality year over year, not the kind of mortality that many people are experiencing. And, um, and again, that should be a great takeaway. There are things you can do. You do this, you get this back in return. So I am actually going to take three minutes here, and I'm sorry I had to do this. this this came out of traveling uh, this spring around, and there's a new method of beekeeping. Some of you might have heard of this. I'd love to have seen a show of hands on this one. I've been in uh, one uh, auditorium or convention center or another, and some wonderful, energetic beekeeping evangelist gets on stage, and they start talking about the bond method of beekeeping. And there's music in the background, and people are scribbling notes. And I, too, was wondering what. And then, of course, the moniker comes up, well, it's called live and let die beekeeping. And I was, huh? Um, and it, it, it's a great gag. It's, it's, it gets a good laugh. And there's actually some merit to it. However, I'm going to make a, a, an argument, a real argument here, that um, whatever we're calling what I'm doing, monitoring, beekeeping, organic green beekeeping, whatever that is, um, I'm making an argument that the problem is I threw this back at one of the presenters was, I, I think you got the wrong Bond movie. It wasn't live and let die. And their argument was, no, 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 no. From the, let, let the bad bees die and the good bees live. And then next year you'll have better bees. And the next year after that you'll have better bees. And it sounds good. I mean, it feels good when you say it. The problem with it is, is that I make the argument that those are not your bees. Um, most of the people that are proselytizing this stuff, they're bee producers themselves. Um, they've been at this for a number of years and are trying to produce survivor stock or survivor yards. And my argument was that the lectures were get, being given to the general beekeeping audience. And that was, those are not your bees. When you buy your package, your nuke um, that's coming from some of you uh, local, most of you from breeding grounds in the south, those are not your bees. Your bees, uh, unfortunately, are genetically challenged, um, are health challenged when you get them. It, it's a supply-demand world we're in right now. And so I'm making the argument that if you try to practice 
the Bond method of beekeeping, it's a different movie. You actually have been given a license to kill your bees, and I'm not such a fan. Um, again, if you want to get on to a survivor program, if you want to get into a multi-year, multi-colony, um, pick the best bees, let the other bees die, so be it. But I'm, I, I just want many of the, the folks listening here to realize those are not your bees. And you have to be very careful about adopting what seems like a very interesting program. But this gets very expensive. It's hard on you. It's hard on your bees. And I came up with another good example. Um, and, 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 and one individual was just so adamant that his program would work for everybody. If we all just let our bees, the bad bees, die, in a very short amount of time, we'd all have better bees. And I can't argue with that logic. But in practicality, here was a good example for me. So when you see dandelions here, a couple of things that are going on. N notice, number one, like keeping bees, which is a bit of an artificial process, uh, it's not completely natural. Um, we have trained, the, in the upper left, we have trained dandelions to flower early. If you look in the, the lower right, dandelions love to grow, you know, 8 inches, 10 inches a foot, then flower out, um, and then do that wonderful um, self-preservation and reseeding that they do. Um, if you look at, uh, the uh, again, the, the smaller dandelions, year over year, by cutting these dandelions down, only the small early bloomers literally blossomed. And so all the other ones are gone, and we, we did this. And this is very much like beekeeping. Varroa is with us. By treating Varroa, we are actually keeping Varroa around. We are making uh, mite resist, uh, miticide resistant Varroa. But the fact of the matter is, it's, it's the game that we are in. You have to play with the bees and the Varroa you got. Uh, maybe another example that might hit home with people are now that we have access um, to, um, and Varroa very much like ticks and fleas, um, now that we have access, do we take that same approach when it comes to our dogs and cats? Um, do we literally say, well, I, I have this great uh, tick and flea uh, medication, uh, but you know what? Um, let, let them go. Um, one year we'll have tick and flea resistant dogs and cats. And, and though that may be possible, we pay a big price to get there. It takes a lot of time. And I'm actually even going to make an argument. I don't think so. If I said don't spray for dandelions, and I like dandelions, by the way. Um, let's just let the grass grow, and let's see what happens over time. I can assure you that the green grass here will lose this particular battle, um, and the dandelions will win it. It's the nature of these two aggressive species. Um, the same thing will happen in your colony. If you don't monitor, if you don't treat, then you will lose that battle, and it's becoming very expensive uh, to, to do so, um, replacing packages, replacing bees year over year. So what are we going to do? Um, what, is, what is monitoring as I now dial in? I'm hoping I've given you a couple of reasons why we need a slightly different approach or new eyes uh, to take a look at things. And, 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 and it isn't surprising. When you look at it, what's odd about a resistance uh, to people monitoring or this kind of interesting anti-monitoring um, or anti-beekeeping approach, because to me they're one and the same, that, that was kind of flourishing this spring, was that in our lives, as you can see, there, there's more monitoring going on than ever. Um, whether you, they're personal monitors, house monitors, whatever, um, we're kind of used to this. Why, why would we be wanting to withhold monitoring from the, you know, this thing, this beekeeping craft uh, that, that we're involved in? So. Let's really get to the, the nuts and bolts of it. Monitoring, basically, keeping it simple, is what do you look for, when do you look, how often do you look, and then what do you do about it? Um, there are more things uh, for that. I mean, it's, it's kind of like trying to tell somebody how to tie their tennis shoes. Sounds simple, but it can get complex. But at the end of the day, a takeaway from here is really simple. Uh, train yourself, what am I looking for, when am I supposed to be looking, how often do I look, and then what do I do about it? And this is what monitoring is attempting to do. Um, it's, it's, it's an attempt to um, 
build on uh, the things that we've learned over years. Um, we've learned a lot about colony management. We've learned a lot more about feeding for starvation and nutrition and stimulation. We've learned a lot about the pests and diseases that are causing us problems and the various treatments that we have. So I, I'm, I'm a little concerned that some of us are, are wanting to back away uh, from that. And again, if, if your sole approach, if you are literally constructively saying, nope, my job is I want to build survivor bees, good. Number one, if you just have one or two or three colonies, that's not a program for you. You need 20, 30 plus colonies in order to have the genetics in order uh, to do this and suffer the mortality because you will lose a lot of bees in the one, three, five, seven years it takes uh, to literally get some good seed stock. So I'm, 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 I'm really talking to the people out there um, who, are, who are the sideline beekeepers, um, the one, two, three colonies. And, and let me even hit you with one more more. I, and don't take me wrong, I love the flow high idea as a concept. I'm a bit of a gadget, gizmo kind of individual. Um, I love the idea. I, it deserves a place in the pantheon of beekeeping equipment. However, um, I think it sends the wrong message to a lot of new beekeepers, and that is somehow we have entered a world that we are a turnkey kiosk, and that we can now just set it and forget it. And then turn the crank and the handle and honey pours out and we can walk away. More than that, if it does work for you, um, the problem is it's suggesting to a lot of beekeepers that you can even be out of your bees even more than you are now. And, and of course, for me, monitoring means no nope. um, proximity. The closer you are to your bees, the more you're going to be in them and frequency. Um, get into those colonies more. You can't hurt your bees by being in them too often. So. Again, so much noise out there. And some students of mine threw this slide at me because I, I tend to labor this particular B curves again. And we want to simplify things. So let's simplify things for one brief moment. Deep breath again. Classic, let's look at an external event again that we monitor. Rain, light, rainfall. Your head sees this and you're just like, ugh. Uh, the typical reaction is you've got to stare into it. What does it mean? How can I interpret this? What, is it, what does it have to do with beekeeping? And the fact of the matter is, let's keep it simple again. This is very classically what the light does over a typical season. That, in, in effect, is related, correlated to temperature, which is, in effect, rainfall. And though these curves skew to the left and to the right a little bit, in general, we can take something that's very complex and we can make it simple. And I think we should always be striving to do that as beekeepers. Let's take a look inside the colony now. That was external events. If you look inside the colony, there's a lot going on there. We have all different stages from egg to um, hatched egg uh, to larva to pupa to capped to emergence to uh, the various um, stages and classes and roles that bees play. And this can be fascinating. Uh, it really can be but it can also be daunting. Um, and it's good to know this, but let's simplify it again. This is a classic B curve uh, through most parts of the states. Um, the height of the summer, you can see, usually correlated with rainfall, nectar flows, um, where there's a lot of feed, there's a lot of, uh, of, of bees. When there's not, there's not. The colony reacts appropriately. You don't want to overgrow your colony when there's no food resources out there. And then we usually have that little Indian summer that creeps along, and, and there we are. So if we put all these together, simple external, simple internal, we arrive at this is kind of what's happening in your bee colony. And this is what I want to bring monitoring to. Monitoring can be simple. We've got to cut through the noise, and we just look at it from a very 10,000-foot view and this is kind of what's going on uh, in most of our colonies. <clears throat> so um, now we add to the level. Um, external, internal, and then along came modern beekeeping, pests and diseases, and where they usually crop up in the season. They kind of are out of phase. They, they come as the bees build. Uh, suddenly there's an opportunity, that geometric growth that I talked about um, on the soybean leaves, um, and all of a sudden they just take off because you have enough larva, you have enough pupa, there's something for pests and diseases to feed off of. 
And so they kind of, again, come a little later, um, but they literally take off, which gives us a couple of cues on where we want to be looking. Again, let's pull back for just a second. Beekeeping, the way most of us learn, is kind of a layered approach. First of all, you know, we all got excited. We banged boxes and frames together. And then where do we put them? Um, and then we get into a little bit of basic bee biology, what they do, when they do, what, whatever. And then along comes external, when, when do these bee curves that I just uh, showed you happen? And most of you are kind of there. Um, what I'm asking for now is that we throw in not the staticky stuff, but now the dynamics of monitoring is the statics was yesterday. The dynamics is today and tomorrow. And so to get there, that learning curve that we talked about, one of them is, and again, this is how to become a monitor, how to, in this case, train your brain. And the best way to do this is get into your colonies as often as you can. And if you're lucky enough to have several or other people's colonies where you can compare and contrast, you can start to see good from bad. You can start to see when things really look fine, when, when colonies look challenged. Um, a great a great frame of brood, just absolutely stunning to one that has, again, this shotgun effect. Um, on the bottom here, you'll learn that this colony on the right is suffering a little bit. This is dry. These eggs are being laid. The larva is hatching, um, but they're dry compared to the ones on the left, where there's lots of royal jelly. This colony is strong enough. They have enough young bees that can produce enough royal jelly. There's a good nutrition source in that colony. And again, monitoring is a, comp it's looking, it's comparing, it's contrasting, it's training your brain to see things that you normally wouldn't see. And as you go along with this, you'll see other things in the colony. So like beekeeping used to be, beekeeping used to not just to be about moving boxes around. Beekeeping as monitoring today means taking a closer look and starting to notice when things look awry, small hive beetle in this case, uh, uh, wax moth uh, take, take over. And the more you look, you are, you keep at beekeeping long enough, again, you're going to no start to notice good from bad, whether it's chalk brood, sack brood, wax moths, um, you are going to see and recognize uh, down in the lower left, uh, American fowl brood, um, down in the lower right, what a perfect, uh, almost perfect frame of, of from a healthy colony, good laying queen, good stock, good genetics. But you've got to, again, train your brain to make that compare and contrast. And early in the game, start noticing when things go awry because of this geometric progression effect. Things just kind of go from bad to worse in a very, very short amount of time. And that's something that you can do. These were some uh, colonies uh, shots that I took um, out in the yard just last fall. And again, you can rapidly see, just again, from a 10,000 foot view, you're, you're, you're obviously, many of you are saying, yeah, I see it. But you've got to get into that colony to see it. And you have to get in often enough. And then you have to be able to do that compare and contrast so that when you see that frame that's in the upper right, um, compared to the lower right and the center, you're going to go, wait a minute, something is definitely wrong here. And, and what is that that I have to do? So again, we start back simple. Bee populations, pests. Here's my argument against the bond method. I put up a new line here, the red line, called the threshold line. We've learned over time that if you let mites, which was primarily the problems that we saw in the former slides, get beyond this threshold, then your colony is doomed. It's um, likely not to recover unless you take amazing aggressive uh, stance in time, um, or it'll start limping along. There's just a whole series, not Varroa, not in and of itself as a pest, but as a vector for pathogens, diseases, brings a lot to the table. And there are a lot of viruses, there are a lot of bacteria that come on board, and even though we can't treat for many of those, per se, we can't actually, we don't have of the 15 or 17 viruses that we've discovered in the last half dozen plus years, we can't treat them per se. But if we treat Varroa and we keep it below a threshold, we keep these 
uh, viruses, these pathogens, from expressing themselves. So in a way, you are treating them by not allowing them uh, to get a grip uh, on your colony. So what are we monitoring? And I've, I've been alluding to that. What is it that you can look for as a beekeeper? What are the big gitches and gotchas out there? In terms of pests, varroa, uh, that's our primary culprit. Small hive beetle for most of us isn't a mortality issue, um, but I think Jim too, I loved it, he described it one day as, it, he called it the uh, athlete's foot of the beekeeping uh, arena. It's not gonna take you down, but it's not gonna make you happy either. Um, and, and for most of us, the same with wax moths and other things. They can be problematic, but many younger beekeepers will say, well, wax moths killed my colony. When in effect, no, wax moths express themselves just like varroa viral issues, um, but it's a weak colony that allows wax moths to take over. So we're, we're kind of going back. Your big one, if you had to pull one, is varroa. When it comes to diseases, we've got some of the old, this, of the things that we can do anything about, and I've left the others out here. American fall brood or um, European fall brood, nosema, um, sac brood, chalk brood. These are things that we can have a, 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 we can monitor for, we can look for, and we can actually treat for, whether that's replacing a queen, a queen in the chalk, uh, chalk brood, uh, sac brood issues, or we are actually putting in some sort of treatment uh, teramycin has become a big issue on the AFB, EFB issues, but that's that's not what this is about. The other one is monitoring also has something to do with, it's a bigger picture. It's not just monitoring for pests and diseases. It has to do with the other resources of a colony. Um, how good is your queen? Um, do I have enough space in that colony? Um, are they going to, you know, get congested and swarm on me early? Is, is there enough honey in there? Is there enough pollen in there to produce healthy, vibrant, uh, young, because again, if you want to control a lot of pests and diseases, you've got to have healthy children. And if, if you're not, if they're literally only being fed sugar water, if they literally have honey in the colony, but they don't have access midsummer to pollen, the, the young bees that are being raised don't have the nutrients, they don't have the protein, the vitamins and minerals in order to create healthy bodies. Um, and so what will happen again is that they'll be more susceptible to pathogens. Um, and again, though you can't treat pathogens specifically much in the beekeeping realm, you can keep them from expressing themselves. So there are a couple of curves out there, and I want to just kind of blow through a couple of these because I do want to leave uh, some time at the end. When you check and when you monitor, even these are becoming to be contentious. Um, like the formulas of yesteryear, um, there was your B curve kind of even more simplified. There was your mite curve even more simplified, and they came on just out of phase. Well, I've been in a lot of bee yards um, lately where early this spring, maybe because of the early spring we had, um, there are, as I showed one of the pictures uh, earlier, there are significant mite loads. So if you're waiting for uh, July, August to start doing sig significant mite checking, you're going to lose that colony. It already has a problem uh, the third going into the fourth month of the year. So monitoring, again, I keep hinting that it has this feed. You've got to go in and establish essentially a baseline. Get into your colony as early as you can. Do that visual and sometimes actual check um, of, of loads, and it will allow you. So one, one good example, and I said I was going to give some examples here, so bear with me. Since Varroa seems to be just that all-encompassing get you. Um, one of the things that I'm advocating anti-bond method is, as a matter of fact, one of the uh, speakers, and it, they're not meaning to be evil, they're trying to push a program. My argument is that, that it doesn't work for most of us, is that they even said, well, I'm not going to check for mites or mite levels because I'm not going to treat anyway. So why, why do it? And again, that's kind of a fix it and forget it kind of beekeeping. And again, you might be able to do that if you're in a, a survivor um, role and mentality and looking to produce that stock. But again, for many of you listening here, that's not you. Um, so I'm advocating a simple sugar shake. Uh, if, if you've seen this out here, uh, uh, half a cup of bees, 300, uh, two to three tablespoons of powdered sugar. You shake them, you shake them. 
um, you, you get literally a mite count. And it turns out that the science that's been coming along says that when we get about 10, out of, 10 mites out of 300 bees or 3%, we're starting to see changes occur in the colony. Um, uh, lower uh, honey production, um, lower brood production, and so forth. So there is a very th distinct cause and effect between varroa mite loads, thresholds, and your colony health. I'm making the argument with monitoring. You can check for that today, and you should. Um, it's easy to do. Once you do one or two mite loads, um, this becomes second nature, um, and it's like taking uh, your temperature with a thermometer. It just It's easy to do. It's something you have control over. So um, the takeaway here is that for when people are asking when to monitor, we kind of initially, even when monitoring came on, fell into an old habit where we said, well, you monitor about midsummer on, and it's kind of like this Doppler effect where it's kind of like eh, a little bit, a little bit, more, 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 less, less, less. And, and, and that's a great uh, mnemonic for remembering what's going on. But the fact of the matter is, I think even monitoring is beginning itself to change because, again, um, when, when, when do you have a problem? Well, you don't know. Seasonally, you have a rough idea. If I told most people, when do you start looking for Varroa, I would say uh, June into July is really a problem. But again, I've been in a lot of colonies recently where they're already having a significant problem um, in March into April. So again, monitoring, it, 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 you, you've got to monitor your colony in your season. And once you establish a line, you'll know if you get in and you have a light mite load, well, you can relax. You can step back and come in three weeks, five weeks, six weeks, and do it again. Um, if you have a high early mite load, then the deal is then treat now um, and then come back and make sure your treatments are working. The idea here is monitoring is very much like um, a lot of sciences in that it's self-correcting. It doesn't have all the answers. It's going to be changing over time, but um, the key is we we have to be very careful about throwing some of these up, and, and even myself, um, that um, there's just trying to stick to a regimen, a recipe will sometimes get you into trouble. So let me just kind of break a bee season up a little bit. I, I like to consider the season two bee seasons, the big nectar flow in the uh, late spring, early summer, and then the Indian fall. Uh, so you literally have two seasons, two opportunities to do things. And in particular, as your bees are building as particular pests and diseases may be building, there are key zones in the summer that really become important uh, to look at and where you can make a significant difference when the populations are there, um, when you want to be looking uh, to make sure that you can reduce things in time uh, to check, check on things before they get out of hand. And one, one big one that I'm going to step on, another monitoring example for me, is nutrition. Um, I, it's highly underrated, underplayed. Um, it turns out that we're beginning to understand that during this uh, summertime, uh, our bees really do suffer from nutrition, uh, nectar, pollen dearths, and these are opportunity times. Monitoring also means treatment, but it's not, treatment can be just simply feeding. Um, and I've got down here feeding for a couple of examples. You can feed for starvation early and late in the year, and then there are opportunities to feed for nutrition or stimulation. And again, monitoring means take a look in those colonies, see if your bees have the resources that they need in there, look at your seasonal map, are those resources coming, and if they're not, treat, treat by feeding. So there are just lots of opportunities there. If you begin to put all of these curves together, it's beginning to look a little complex, but I think we put them in layers so that if you basically are kind of looking at your bees from this point of view, it's giving you at least a first start. Uh, there, there's more to monitoring than this, but this gives you uh, a 10,000 foot view on where you can be looking um, at your colonies, um, when you should be looking, and what you can do. Um, a good example, again, for uh, facts for a lot of younger beekeepers, if you're putting that second or third colony where you are, why you have to monitor for feed, food, not only will it affect the health of your bees and the expression of pathogens, but just take a look at some of the numbers here and what it actually takes um, to put a colony in place. So we start talking in terms of the hundreds of millions and even billions of flowers 
that you need for one to ten colonies. And you've got to ask yourself, monitoring your external environment, do I have those kind of resources in my environment? I mean, am I near alfalfa? Am I near, um, you know, black locust, um, whatever, that, clover that's blooming for you? In the beginning, yes, but what about midsummer? What about late summer? Um, and again, you've got to monitor those external resources um, in terms of, of where you're going. And again, I'm just kind of throwing this out here. You see it a couple of times, it'll get there. So I'm going to go through a couple of these. I'm, I'm seeing the time uh, uh, rapidly go by. And one of them is, um, I do want to leave this one. If you get to monitoring for me, some people just think it takes too much time. Um, I can't get in, do all these tests, do all these experiments. I'm making an argument that if you really want to break monitoring down to its basics, all you have to do is pull the boxes apart, get to the center of the brood nest, pull out one frame, and that frame will tell you almost everything you need to know. You'll see whether there's nutrition there, you'll see if there's a disease or pest expression there, and that can only take just a couple of minutes. So this is one of those slides I, I warned you about, a recipe slide come back to this one. I promised that there was going to be a, a, a recipe for lowering um, uh, mortality. Uh, come back to this one um, later on. There's not time here to do it, but here's a, a good recipe card uh, for reaching what I call near zero hive loss uh, through monitoring. Hit this one again. Just a handful of pests, a handful of diseases, a handful of treatments, and then timely monitoring, and then come back and make sure that your treatments are working for you um, and that this just takes a little bit of time. So a couple of things here, because I promised I was going to leave a moment for questions. These are here. Um, I'm not trying to beat up anybody here, but for a lot of younger beekeepers, we get into this kind of spiral of I don't want to know what I don't want to know. Um, and beekeeping today, it has to be a much more pro proactive you're the, you're the person, you're the one, um, your bees, you're like being a, I hate to put it in such language, but as a pet parent, you take care of your pets. Today, you have to take care of your bees. And again, this is anti-bee mentality. One last little note for me, if I can, and it's a tough one for people. I walk into my colonies assuming that things are bad. Um, and I wait for them to prove that they're fine. And as soon as I see good brood, good food, good nutrition, lack of disease, pests, then I, I, I'm fine. And, 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 and that, that can be a really great uh, adoption, I think. It can work for people. Uh, they, because what we've been doing, we assume things are fine until they're not. And I, I think that can be a, a little day, a slippery slope to be on. Uh, other things in monitoring are coming. I didn't get a chance to chat about, but you can actually monitor for clean productivity, egg laying ability, and so forth. Um, and there are a whole series of things um, that are coming this way. Monitoring is changing. Um, it's going to get better over time, um, and, I, and, and again, sorry about that, but we just have to, I, I, I keep hitting you here, but so many younger beekeepers are just so concerned that I just can't get on top of this. This might not be my thing, um, and I'm just trying to say it's another one. Second recipe card, stick it in your Rolodex. It's out there. I encourage you to take a look at it. The red uh, are new additions to beekeeping, and, um, and so we're wrapping up. Um, my biggest one, and I really want to tell you from that curve that I showed you before, if many of you listening here adopt a kind of monitoring methodology or an attitude toward beekeeping, you're going to see that it, in fact, um, is going to reduce that these mortality numbers by a huge amount. And here's my PS. I keep saying this one, uh, just a gaffe at the end while people are putting their thoughts together. I run across this all the time. Literally, um, people in the car, um, they hate it when I'm in the car because cars are driving past me all the time. I'm saying monitoring. does This is a form of monitoring. Please, some of you, do me a favor. Make sure your headlights are working, both of them, on your car, um, and we can get there. Questions, anybody? Great. Thanks, Alex. What, oh. does, P yeah. what does PPB mean? <laughs> I, I knew that one was going to come Somebody up. Somebody was going to ask me. I was going to suggest I knew that pretty poor beekeepers. <laughs> Pretty um, that's a nice way of saying yes. that. That's a really nice way. That's a nice way of saying that. Let's go with that. Right, okay? You fill in the other P. <laughs> that's right. 
Uh, thanks, Anybody Alex. Else? Folks, um, um, I know Alex would appreciate a thank you in the chat pod. And then if you have questions, go ahead and, and put those in. Um, I didn't get to read Swarmcatcher's whole um, question or comment, but I know he's made the point in the past about packages coming into us already with, with PESS, with Varroa. Um, can you uh, say a few words about that, Alex? It's simply in a, a supply-demand crash. And so lack of, of fancy language, we have a lot of puppy mills out there or bee mills that are producing our stock for us. And so I am less concerned about the, um, it's hard to actually monitor for the mite loads in a package. A nuke maybe um, because you, you need a sample of 300 and, and, and many of us are trying to be careful as we're letting our bees get started. If it's a nuke, you should be able to see the laying patterns already and whether or not there are any expressions going on. The tougher issue with many of these, to be honest with you, is that whether it's a package or a nuke, it's queens that are really the problem here. Um, we need to alter the very nature of how queens are produced, the health and the vigor of queens, which is where a lot of my work is going. And we will get there. Um, I am, I'm assured that we will get here. Um, but um, I would say that when you put in a, a new package or a new nuke, this is particularly, you want to see whether or not you were given, uh, for the lack of a better analogy, a Volkswagen engine or a Hemi engine to start that colony off. And you literally need to check that. And so watch, the, what, you know, in, a, after your bees, your packages, they start laying. You can start looking uh, 12 days, you should see, um, from, from a fresh egg to cap brood. You can start checking to see if it's on track. And that's what monitoring does. Did I get what I paid for? Um, is it on track? And is there anything I can do to get it back on track? So, anything else? I know that was fast, folks. And, and, and somebody asked me whether or not the presentation was available. And as Denise has said, yes. I deliberately threw some slides in there so that you could look at them offline um, to get more information. But, um, and, and let me just, I, I see some questions rolling by and I wanted to get to someone. When you're doing monitoring, um, often this can lead to treatment. Um, and the, and the question was, are there less aggressive treatments out there? And there are. There are things that you can do. Um, this is not the place for that. But let me, let me assure you, doing nothing is a recipe for colony collapse and disaster. It just is. Um, earlier slide from the fellow that got 10 nukes as a birthday present. Um, but, um, if you're willing to work at it, the, the, the less, tr aggressive treatments, the organics and inorganic chemicals that you want to use, the more monitoring you have to do. And and for some of you that's a that's a good trade off. So